Hi students, welcome to HSC Biology and Module 7 on Infectious Disease. This is video number 10 and we're going to have a little bit of a look at fungal pathogens in Australian plants. So in this little section what you need to be able to do is to investigate the response of a named Australian plant to a named pathogen through practical and or secondary source investigations and for this first one fungal pathogens are the focus. So as you go through this particular video and the exercises that we do in class, what we want you to be able to do is make sure you can match a fungal pathogen and an Australian plant species. If the rain lets up, we'll make sure we go out and have a look for some, um, but that's just a little tricky at the moment. What we want you to be able to do is to have a case study that you can talk about in terms of the relationship between the fungal pathogen and its host plant species. And if you can talk about that in more general terms with a couple of examples, that's even better. So I guess the first thing we need to do is we need to have a quick look at plant responses to pathogens. And plant responses to pathogens come in two main forms, passive or active. In terms of passive approaches, there's, there's again, uh, I guess, two subcategories, the physical barriers and the chemical barriers. And so when we're studying fungal diseases, what we want to do is we want to look at um, how do the pathogens overcome these um, both passive and active responses of the plant in order to um, establish themselves and take hold. The first thing they have to do is they have to, um, I guess, specialise in a particular area of the plant. So if we think about plants, we're thinking about three primary tissues for most plants, and that is leaves, stems or trunks, and roots. Now, there are other um, seasonal kind of uh, structures in plants, particularly flowers or fruits, um, but primarily for um, organisms that want to be um, living on plants on a regular basis, they're going to need to establish themselves in one of these three main regions. Now, the plant knows that, or at least the plant has um, evolved to become aware of that. And so as a result, one of the things that we see is these thick cuticles. We know that there is a waxiness to them, that they're usually impervious to water, often on the, and that's why they're on the upper surface, not on the lower surface. There still needs to be gas exchange that's occurring. Uh, but that not only provides a barrier to water, but it also provides a nice barrier to the um, invasion of different types of pathogens. Some types of cell walls have been reinforced. Um, to increase their strength and obviously the cell wall sits outside of the cell membrane so it's an extra level of protection between the outside of the plant and the internal um, structure of the cells themselves. Um, sunken stomata we've talked about in terms of um, how they can help in the um, minimizing or reduction of water loss of plants but that also plays a role in um, uh, minimizing infection from pathogens Bark itself is often um, non-living tissue and it's hard and it's a much more difficult surface for um, pathogens to take hold and to come through and even things like vertically hanging leaves and as the rain as that we've seen a lot of recently um, falls on those leaves we get um, anything on the surfaces of them being washed away. But if the physical barriers don't work and there's um, other things needed. What are some of the other things that the plants can do? Well, they do produce a number of different types of chemicals. We know some of the chemicals that they produce because we actually use some of them. Um, but they, these include things like glucosides, saponins, um, toxin neutralizing enzymes, pathogen uh, associated molecular pattern receptors, these little PAMPs, uh, and these are part of when the system is starting to move from a passive system towards a more active system, towards a system that actually identifies or recognises um, particular pathogens in order to try and deal with them. Most of the time these structures or these secretions are simply designed to try and minimise any uh, exposure to pathogens that the plant may have. Some of these more active ones, and as I mentioned in the previous slide, the PAMP ones is, is part of this transition towards specific pathogen recognition. And we'll look at the human system and how we, we also have passive systems and active systems, systems that act in a non-specific way and others which are very specific in terms of recognizing the pathogen and identifying a particular response to that pathogen. 
and that involves signal detection. There's got to be something about the pathogen that's not only going to be recognized by the host, but is going to trigger some sort of a response. Um, there's two, I guess, scales of response for plants. The first is a rapid active response, an increase in the permeability of the cell membranes to iron movement, and in particular, to the movement of calcium ions into the cell. Sometimes you might find there's a release of hydrogen peroxide. That's the H2O2 is hydrogen peroxide. Hydrogen peroxide. Uh, most famous for elephant toothpaste uh, experiments. And that's an oxidative burst. And that can often um, flush oxygen into the system and, um, and pathogens don't like it. In fact, your dentist may have told you to um, rinse your mouth after brushing with uh, peroxide. And, it, and that release of oxygen is something that a lot of bacteria don't like. They prefer to be living in anaerobic conditions. So that release of oxygen often um, disrupts their growth patterns. We talked about um, an increase in the strength or the reinforcement of the cell walls. And of course, apoptosis is another important process, which is a programmed cell death. It's basically, uh, if cells have become infected with pathogens, often they will release certain chemicals that'll start that process of um, cell death. And obviously that, that means that the not only the contents of the cell, which is the pathogen, but also the contents of the actual cell itself are not going to be available. So they need to be either released or reabsorbed. Those responses are fairly quick. There is a slower response, the delayed active response. And this is something that can happen over not just um, you know, hours, but over days or weeks. So wound repair would be one example. If um, a tree has um, been hit with an ax, for example, you might find some sap running out. Uh, of the trunk if the if the cut goes deep enough into the phloem. And so often you'll find a release of uh, cork cells, cambium cells that are that are going to specialize in sealing off that that outer layer uh, along with the production of uh, gums and things like that, which can help um, to to reseal that. If you if you're thinking about physical barriers and the trunk of the tree as a physical barrier, it creates a barrier between the internal parts of the plant and the external environment. If that gets broken in any way, it's like our skin being cut. Um, we need to try and repair that as quickly as possible, and so does the plant. Um, it can also release some antimicrobial lysosomes. These are the um, basic structures within the um, uh, within the cells themselves. So, so the actual enzymes would be the lysozymes. Um, and the structures, uh, we've, we've talked about them as our little um, waste cleaning sections. Um, there can be memory cell um, chemicals, and we'll talk about memory cells specifically when we talk about the immune system later on, but this can be um, something that the cell, uh, that, that the plant, the individual can um, remember um, and release these things. So salicylic acid, um, for example, can be released um, and um, this is a form of acquired resistance. So again, in, in humans, we're going to talk about innate immunity, what we're born with, basically, and acquired. So what happens in the course of our lives is we are exposed to all sorts of things from our mother's breast milk um, through to potentially vaccines, for example, but also pathogens themselves. As we contract particular types of diseases, the pathogens enter our body and our bodies then make a specific response uh, often to those particular pathogens. But we'll look at that more when we look at um, our own responses to disease. So what we want you to do is we want you to create a um, short case study. We want you to focus on a fungal pathogen. And what we're specifically looking at is the relationship between the pathogen and the host. EasyHSC is a little site that I've seen that has some material that um, addresses the new courses and they have put together a case study on Phytophthora dieback. That's something that you can have a look at. Um, some of the uh, species chosen are things like avocado um, and you may want to choose something that's a little more quintess quintessentially Australian, but nothing wrong with that. We all love a bit of smashed avo. Um, what we need you to do then is to look at the symptoms. So how do we know that the plant is unwell? Um, so when we look at plant disease, 
Remember, we're primarily looking at those three regions, the stem um, or the trunk, the leaves and the roots, and to see what sort of things we can see that are telling us that this is a fungal pathogen that's affecting this particular plant. Uh, any prevention, so what sort of um, strategies does it have? So this could be around barriers, um, but it could also be certain things that we do um, or places where we might plant or not plant um, certain individuals in order to protect them from these sorts of uh, pathogens. And also then, uh, I guess, what we might call uh, the third C, consequence. So can we prevent it? If we can't, can we cure the plant? Or if not, how do we control the disease so that even if it does kill that individual, it doesn't spread um, to other individuals? So this is the sort of stuff you're looking for in your case study. Make sure you put um, these key points together. A picture is also worth um, including so you know exactly what it is that you're talking about. Thanks for watching.